Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is April 27th, 2021, and this is part 12 of my series Passover, Not Easter. This one is called the Malachi Prophecy. Today is the first day of the second Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, this is really a hidden feast in Scripture, the second Passover leading to the second Feast of Unleavened Bread, which lasts for a week. And then the culmination of this uh, feast is coming this coming Sunday morning, which is the second Feast of First Fruits. Yesterday, uh, my wife and I celebrated second Passover. And um, we both have a real sense of uh, expectation about this coming Feast of First Fruits. We believe that this could be the birthing of the man child. Uh, she and I hope that we would be chosen for that, but, um, you know, God has not told us that, and God certainly has not given us a date. However, <clears throat> when you look at what's going on in the world today, um, things are devolving very quickly uh, into chaos. This, uh, this jab that people are getting is evidently a very nefarious thing that is happening to people. The entire hoax that's been perpetrated upon the world over the last year with respect to you-know-what is um, really beyond comprehension. Uh, I'm 65 years old. I've never seen anything approaching what we are in right now. I've heard of people who are taking this jab so that they can travel. Well, you know, I go on day trips. I live in pretty much a wilderness area and uh, I will travel all day in a circuit around my home, leave in the morning, get back in the evening and have a wonderful time without visiting any of the cabal's cities and certainly never go to any of their um, entertainments and don't participate in their entertainments. I do not watch TV, have not watched TV for virtually um, our entire marriage, which is 44 years. We've watched um, 40, 43 years this year, my wife and I have been married, but we, we've watched we watched a few things in our young days, um, some of the sitcoms like MASH, but um, and the and then we watched Sherlock Holmes uh, with Jeremy Brett in the uh, mid '80s when I was going to law school. But that is about it. Besides a few choice movies that we've collected over the years, like Fiddler on the Roof, and some other things. Um, my wife and I have a real sense that this year is it. We believe that, that the first fruits Kodeshim have to be glorified in order to stop what is coming upon the world. Jesus said in Matthew 24 that if he did not return, no flesh would remain alive. That's a serious that's a serious thing to say. Uh, and look at what's happening today. You know, it's unbelievably evil what our governments have done. They have spent untold billions of dollars creating viruses and creating chemical weapons and creating weapons of mass destruction. Unbelievable what they've done, what Satan has inspired people to do to literally destroy the entire human race. And now they're in the midst of trying to make all of us slaves. Kill a lot of us, 
and the rest, the ones that don't die, would become slaves plugged into the matrix, becoming part of the singularity, part of the artificial intelligence and people who would survive would be ruled by machine and someone else's dictates rather than their own. That's where we're headed. And that's not far off. Ray Kurzweil, a very brilliant inventor and part of the New World Order, wrote a book in 2005 called The Singularity. And he predicted that the singularity would in fact be complete by the year 2030. We're only nine years from that. And mankind's destruction, I believe, will come before that unless the Kodashim are glorified. The first fruits Kodashim because they will be able to stop what is coming. Now, Satan's kingdom has been divided. I've talked about that in my series, The Mystery of the Beast. And many of us expected and wanted Donald Trump to become president. I believe that he still will become president, but understand this. He is the eighth head of the beast. And the Bible prophesies that he also will be part of this causing the mark of the beast. So whether or not we had this current false president or Donald Trump, we are still looking at an incredibly hard time for the people that remain on earth. So either way, I expected times to become hard. Now I support Donald Trump because he is God's anointed for this time. He is the one who is called to bring down Babylon the Great. He is the one who has been called to destroy Satan's kingdom. Read again, if you haven't recently, Revelation chapter 17 and Revelation chapter 18. 18 describes the total destruction of Babylon the Great. Chapter 19 of Revelation talks about the second coming of Christ. Now today, I want to go into the Malachi prophecy. This will probably be the last video in this series. And I'm going to begin by reading from Numbers chapter 18, verses 20 to 23. And the Lord said to Aaron, You shall have no inheritance in their land, neither shall you have any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the people of Israel. To the Levites I have given every tithe in Israel for an inheritance, in return for their service that they do, their service in the tent of meeting, so that the people of Israel do not come near the tent of meeting, lest they bear sin and die. But the Levites shall do the service of the tent of meeting, and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations, and among the people of Israel they shall have no inheritance." Now, I believe that what God is saying in verse 23 is that the Levites would bear the iniquity of the people. And that is going to be, we're going to see that come into play in the coming years, I believe. Now, one of the things that I never understood, at least until about eight years ago, I did not understand this idea of God being our inheritance. You know, as I thought about it, you know, I love land, I love streams, I love fields and rivers and mountains, and, you know, I want a land inheritance, you know. 
Um, and I thought, wow, the Levites seem, that, that just seems unfair because the people are getting this beautiful land, the land flowing with milk and honey. And doesn't everybody receive God as their inheritance? Well, that's really the, the whole point. God is creating man after his own image. And our Father will be our inheritance. And that means everything that he owns then becomes what we own. And that's, that's just profound. The Levites in this scripture, in Numbers, the Levites represent the first people of all creation who come into their full inheritance. Thus God calls them his first fruits. And that's why I'm dealing with this today because we are coming up to the Feast of First Fruits and it's the second Feast of First Fruits. And this particular Feast of First Fruits actually occurs on the seventh day from Passover. Jesus was resurrected on the third day and this coming first fruits is the seventh day. And as I went over last time from Numbers chapter 19 with respect to the, um, the waters of purification and the red heifer, we are to purify ourselves on the third and the seventh day. God specifically chose the Levites to guard and protect the testimony. The reason for setting a guard about the tabernacle and the ark of the testimony was not to protect God's things from men's unclean hands. Rather, it was to protect unclean men from being consumed by God's presence. At least three times, God instructed the Levites to kill any person who attempted to break through to gaze upon the holy places within the tabernacle. This command uses natural consequences to illustrate spiritual realities. We first see this idea clearly illustrated when God prepared to reveal the Ten Commandments to Israel at Mount Sinai. Now I'm reading from Exodus chapter 19, starting with verse 9. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe you forever. When Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments. Here is that idea of washing. We are to wash ourselves with the word. Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. We are entering the third day from the day of Christ, the day that Christ was here on the earth. He was here at the beginning of the fifth day. So we've lived through the fifth day, the sixth day, and now we are at the beginning of the seventh day which is also the third day because God evidently likes to count in thousand year periods of time. So here we are getting ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Well, this is prophesying the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ. And you shall set limits for the people all around, saying, Take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot, whether beast or, or man, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. But do not go up into the mountain. 
So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people and they washed their garments. Now, I, I was going to share a video dealing with the mountains of Israel. Prophetically, the overcomers are the mountains of Israel. And I believe that this is in, um, especially in Ezekiel chapter 35, that you see this. Ezekiel 35, 36, 37, you have these references to the mountains of Israel. And when you read it next time, think of it in terms of those being the glorified overcomers. And also when you read Matthew 24, When Jesus says to flee to the mountains when you see the abomination of desolation, you who are in Judea. Who is in Judea? A Jew is in Judea. True Jews live in Judea. So Judea prophetically is talking about where the true believers are. So true believers when you see the abomination of desolation, when things become extremely difficult, flee to the mountains. The overcomers are the mountains. The Kodeshim, the glorified Kodeshim, are the mountains. You come up to the mountain, but you cannot go into the mountain. The mountains will have been glorified. The mountains will stand in the presence of God, but they will also come to the earth. And they will look like regular men, regular people. And people will not know. Literally, they will not know that these are glorified, immortal beings. This is a profound truth. But they are going to be the ones who protect the bride, the ones who protect the church for the tribulation coming. There will be provision. Do not take the mark. There will be provision for God's people. Concerning these people, these are the Levites who did not go astray. Read Ezekiel chapter 44 concerning these people. And it will talk about those who are in the presence of God, only dressed in linen, the white linen, the righteousness. They're dressed in righteousness. But when they go out to minister to the people, they change their garments. They put on wool. They put on natural, a natural covering. And that's how people will see them. And they will not know. It's going to be very much like the first time that Jesus Christ came. People did not know who he was. And that's going to happen again. Remember, all of Scripture is prophetic. All of Scripture is a parable. Everything Jesus said was a parable. Everything he did was a parable. His coming a second time is also written in such a way that people do not really know what to expect unless they have really been diligently looking into these things. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. So wash your garments. Let's continue to wash our garments. We need to wash ourselves in the word every day. Give us our daily bread. Give us our daily manna. Feed us every day, Lord, by your spirit. We need to be receiving a word from the Lord every day as we go through this time. God warned Moses to instruct the people this way in order to put the fear of God into them. The stark reality was that if the Levites or someone else did not physically kill the person presumptuously attempting to peer at or into the presence of God, 
then God himself would destroy him. So Moses continues to write, and again, this is Exodus 19, verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. A very loud trumpet blast. Paul prophesies about the last trumpet right before the glorification in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord, Yahuwah, had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through to the Lord to look, and many of them perish. Well, what do we have here? The Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Isn't that glorification. But immediately after the glorification, the Lord says to Moses, go down and warn the people. The Kodeshim will be warning people. The Kodeshim will be providing for people safe havens. Go down and warn the people lest they break through to the Lord to look and many of them perish. Also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves lest the Lord break out against them. Many people are going to be instructed now by the Kodeshim, by the glorified first fruits, so that the, the priests of God, the church of God, will really begin to understand the truth that God has put into his word. And they will have time to understand this, but it will be a time of great fearfulness in the earth according to Luke 21. And Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai for you yourself warned us saying, set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord said to him, go down and come up bringing Aaron with you, but do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. We cannot presume to offer strange fire to God. There will be no more lying prophets in the church. No more people who pretend that they hear God when they really don't. No more people who who say they're doing the things of God when God did not send them because there will be judgments against them like there was against Ananias and Sapphira when they lied to the Spirit. There will be no more lies among the people of God within their hearts. So Moses went down to the people and told them. The reality was that the people of Israel were not ready to behold God face to face, as was Moses. As was Moses. Seeing God face to face. Read again 1 John chapter 2, end of chapter 3, and that's what that is all about. Over a long period of time of dwelling outside the camp of his own people, God had worked deep humility into Moses' soul. Moses thus became a prophetic picture of the one who has worked out his salvation in fear and trembling. He became the prophetic picture of the one who had saved his soul. Not talking about his spirit, his soul, his mind, his will, his emotions. The book of Hebrews deals exclusively with the salvation of the soul versus the salvation of the spirit by faith in Jesus Christ. The writer of that book alludes specifically to the awesome event of Mount Sinai described by Moses. In Hebrews 12, starting at verse 18, he says, For you have not come to what may be touched, 
a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a, and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. That word assembly is church. You have come to the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. And to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns us from heaven. See, the writer is talking to Christians. In the Old Testament, the Israelites could not not escape if they refused him who warned him, if they disobeyed the law. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. That's where we're at now, the shaking of the earth and the heavens. The stars will fall from the heavens. The time has come for the judgment of the evil ones, the evil spirits who have disobeyed God. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. We are to be such that we cannot be shaken by the things that are going on. We need to walk in faith and believe that God will indeed provide for us, that he will make a way through even the waters of the Red Sea when Pharaoh, the king of this world, is right behind us. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. That's our task. Our task is to offer God acceptable worship. Just the other day, I wrote a new song. Uh, I think it was Friday. And I was just putting some music together and had some chords and I was playing some lead guitar over it and I thought that that was pretty much it. And then suddenly I had words to the melody of the lead guitar I was playing and it began songs in the nighttime. And then I wrote down the lyrics that I had, uh, you know, a lot of times when God gives me a new song, I will also have words that go along with what, with the music that he gave me. And So I named the song, Songs in the Nighttime. And then I remembered a scripture I had read and I looked it up. And this is from uh, Isaiah 30. So let me just share that with you here because this whole idea of worshiping God in this time is, is very important. Because we're not called to go out and fight the devil in the flesh. So many Christians do their work in the flesh. They think that if they fast, if they pray hard enough, strong enough, loud enough, that they can somehow twist God's arm and make him do something. Make him do something to free them and and stop this slavery. But it's still a work in the flesh. Are we going to complete in the flesh what God began in the spirit? No, we're not. So let's look at Isaiah 30, verse 29. 
I went right here. It was shortly after I wrote the song, and the, the song began, Songs in the Nighttime. So here's the scripture, Isaiah 30, verse 29. You shall have a song as in the night when a holy feast is kept. And here I have been teaching about the Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread now for weeks. You shall have a song as in the night when a holy feast is kept and gladness of heart as when one sets out to the sound of the flute to go to the mountain of the Lord, to the rock of Israel. There's the mountain. And the Lord will cause his majestic voice to be heard and the descending blow of his arm to be seen in furious anger and a flame of devouring fire with a cloud burst and storm and hailstones. The Assyrians will be terror stricken at the voice of the Lord. The Assyrians here prophetically mean Babylon the Great. Assyria was the world empire before Babylon and the beast kingdom before Babylon. The Assyrians will be terror stricken. The devil worshipers, the satanic kingdom will be terror stricken at the voice of the Lord when he strikes with his rod. Now listen to this, verse 32. And every stroke of the appointed staff that the Lord lays on them will be to the sound of tambourines and lyres. Can you believe that? Every stroke with his rod is to the sound of worship. To the sound of worship. Battling with brandished arm, he will fight with them. For a burning place has long been prepared indeed. For the king it is made ready, its pyre made deep and wide, with fire and wood in abundance. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of sulfur, kindles it. I was just blown away when I read that. So back to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. For our God is a consuming fire. Well, that's how that just ended in Isaiah chapter 30, isn't it? This passage from Hebrews speaks to God's overcomers, to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. This is the group which the Old Testament Levites typify. These are the ones who first come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. The first ones who come there in the spirit. They are also the ones who teach and prepare others to come into the city of God, into New Jerusalem, while at the same time they protect them from destruction by attempting to come into the presence of God too soon. This also explains why the Levites had no natural inheritance. Their inheritance lies within the spiritual realm of heaven itself, wherein they will dwell in the very presence of God. God used the tribe of Levi to illustrate the spiritual inheritance of a people who willingly submitted to and obeyed the God of the universe. Spiritual Levites inherit nothing less than New Jerusalem itself. Now I want to uh, remind you now of this important passage from Revelation chapter three, verses seven through 13. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will open. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. That has been our work to do. We have 
remain faithful to the testimony, to the law and to the testimony, Isaiah says in chapter 8. And that's where we have been. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Now, there are different interpretations to the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews, but I believe that this is speaking of the vast Christian church. They say they are Jews. They say they are Christians. A true Christian is acknowledges Jesus Christ, the Jew, as their king. But Christians have gone astray, just like the Levites went astray. And we'll read about that. Well, you read about that in Ezekiel chapter 44. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. These, the people who have always rejected the overcomer, the people who have, who have always rejected the true prophetic word for titillation, for goosebumps and thrills and gold dust and things like that, and name it, claim it, uh, prosperity teaching. The people, those people who have always rejected the true prophetic word will come and bow down before the feet of the overcomers and they will learn that I have loved you because you have kept my word about patient endurance and I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. We are entering that hour. We have entered, or we are on the verge of entering because these overcomers will be kept from that hour. And we are right there. And it's going to try everyone who dwells on the earth. I am coming soon. Look how there's even a prophecy now that Christ is coming soon at this time, at this hour. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown, the crown of righteousness, the crown of life. The one who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. So Jesus will write his name on us, his Father's name on us, New Jerusalem upon us, and we will become a pillar in the temple of God because God is our inheritance. See, this is talking about our inheritance being everything that God is. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then another great verse concerning this idea is Revelation 21, verses 20, 22 to 27. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day. And there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So what you see here is that those kings of the earth, they will be clean. They will be righteous. They will be able to come into the city. The kings of the earth will be the glorified Kodeshim. This inheritance, however, does not belong exclusively to prophetic Levi. He simply represents all of the first ones who come into oneness with God. Malachi prophesies Levi's still future role. This is now from Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Behold, I send my messenger. And he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. 
Again, the temple, we are his temple. The Lord will come to his temple and he will glorify his temple. And then we become pillars within the temple of God. And the message of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings and righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old and as in former years. So that was Malachi 3, 1 through 4. Once Levi has been fully purified, refined, and prepared by his Lord, he will prepare the rest of the world for also coming into Christ's presence. The knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. That prophecy has not yet been fulfilled. It will be fulfilled when the overcomers have been glorified and begin to rule during the millennial reign. I'm going to read the last line again. Once Levi has been fully purified, refined, and prepared by his Lord, he will prepare the rest of the world for also coming into Christ's presence. For if it were not so, the decree of utter destruction found in the final verse of the Old Testament would be fulfilled. And now I'm going to read Malachi 4, the entire chapter. For behold, the day is coming burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children, and he will turn the hearts of children to their fathers lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Thus we see Christ's Passover worked out in its fullness. The first Passover saved only the firstborn of Israel. God then substituted the entire tribe of Levi for these firstborn and placed upon them the mantle of bringing all Israel into God's presence. These Levites then foreshadowed the man-child of Revelation, the firstborn sons of God in the exact image of their creator and father. They will become the messengers who are fully empowered to bring the entire earth into the knowledge and obedience of God, for otherwise the Lord would, as most suspect, come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. How wonderful, how merciful our God is. Thank you, Lord. May your kingdom come soon. Amen.